studio with New York Times best selling author John Gilstrap. Good morning. Still trying to get used to that high chair. <laughs> you are way up there. But I can see you. I can see your eyes. You have dominion over the, all the do. kingdom of beneath My you. My feet don't touch the floor. They, they kind of swing a little bit. But <laughs> uh, We have uh, a few things to get to in this uh, segment uh, with Teresa McCabe from WVU Medicine. Teresa, good morning. Good morning. Pickleball. Yes. Taking over the world. I know, isn't it? Yeah. And, yeah, and we switched our tennis tournament last year to pickleball. So because all the pickleball people are using the tennis courts now. I know. Yes. Right. They are. Yeah. How did the tournament do last year? It, it we did well last year. Um, the tournament we used the f- proceeds to fund scholarships mm-hmm. for local high school students going into pre med. Um, we started out <clears throat> years ago with the tennis tournament, the Frank Sabato right. um, tennis tournament. And now we've expanded it to also those students uh, studying to be physician's assistants or nurse practitioners. So those three areas. So. Very nice. When is the tournament this year? It is uh, Saturday, September 7th at the Randy Smith Center in Inwood. How do you register? You register, you may register online by going to our WVU Hospitals East Foundation website, um, or you can call our office. Which would you prefer I do? Um, probably call, the website. Call the website. <laughs> go to the website. Yeah. yeah, don't call the website. No, you go yeah. to the website. Yes. Uh, now, I'm going to let you introduce our next guest, Dr. Michael Laudner, because uh, there are a few really important things to talk about here. Go right ahead. Absolutely. Dr. Laudner uh, is joining us this morning via telephone. Um, very busy man, but he worked us in. Um, and uh, he is our Vice President of Medical Affairs at Berkeley Medical Center. So good morning, Dr. Ladner. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you all? We are great. It's wonderful to have you this morning. Where Where are you uh, located as we speak? I'm sitting right outside the emergency department. I just finished the shift there. Oh. I'm trying to sort out the rest of the day, but I wanted to call in and Maybe provide some information for y'all. That would be wonderful. U.S. News and World Report has recently uh, cited WVU Medicine and for uh, a couple of different specialties as well as best hospitals as a high-performing hospital in three specialties, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, COPD, heart attack, and heart failure. This is the highest distinction a hospital can earn for U.S. News best hospitals procedures and conditions ranking. So uh, first and foremost, tell me uh, what it means to the hospital to get that, uh, I don't know if you call it an award or recognition. Yeah, so it it is unbelievably um, positive for us. A lot of our providers have taken the last 36 months to try and get back on track with what we consider sort of bread and butter medicine after the disaster that was COVID, you know, sort of decimated the staff, the community, everybody else. Um, And a lot of those folks, of course, were in these high-risk populations. And so we made a concerted effort in our strategic plan for the 24 months uh, that ended just the last year and so into this year to really get back on track with treating those patients with the highest quality that we could. And what you see is the result of the of the fruits of those labors with some of our pulmonologists being top providers in the state, a number of our um, patients no longer requiring admission but being managed at home. Um, and the same thing in the heart uh, in the heart condition world you know, getting our STEMI program, which is the heart attack program back on track, um, and also treating from the clinics congestive heart failure and cardiomyopathy um, with some of the leading providers in the state. Um, we recently recruited yet another heart failure person, so that, that clinic will operate actually as an independent clinic separate from the heart clinic. And so a lot of innovation and collaboration in the last 24 months, things we did not provide before, which are now available right here in our neighborhood, um, and then with continued growth in those areas. I just want to tack on to that. Um, the American Heart Association also recognizes, recognized us with our Get With the Guidelines in stroke. Um, it's the first time in, the, in, in our history that we've been able to achieve that status, and that's uh, treating stroke with what you would consider those clot-busting agents uh, here at TNK um, in under 60 minutes and at greater than 85% of the time. And so that is a huge national distinction for us. Um, it also lays the foundation for what will be an interventional stroke program that will be starting here before the first of the year. So these are all brand new services that we did not provide in the past. And not only are we bringing them here, but we're bringing some of these amazing providers here that bring all of their experience 
um, and things that we can now treat locally without having to send people out to other facilities that are sort of a higher level of care. So me, I, I know that was a lot of information, but I figured I'd put it on the table and then let you ask sort of questions. No, you're good. And, and I should point out, too, this is Berkeley Medical Center, which is getting this recognition. This is very, very local. And this was done based on evaluations of nearly 5,000 hospitals across 15 specialties and 20 procedures and conditions. Uh, were the folks at the hospital aware of, of these evaluations as they go on? Is it, is it specific that you're providing data, or is this something that, that happens without you even knowing, Teresa or Dr. Laudner? Yeah, so a lot of this stuff goes on in the background. So U.S. World Report will do surveillance studies through some of the various agencies um, and get that data. Then at some point we do submit to a number of these uh, honor rolls our individual data for providers and for patients. So it's a sort of a mixture of both. Um, and it's always been sort of, um, you know, I think people get a little bit nervous when we talk about merit badge medicine and are you reporting and what grades and scores are you getting. This really is a much broader based, uh, US News and World Report is a much broader based sort of just evaluation across the, the country of what places are doing and how they're doing it so we can look at best practice modeling. And, and then if there are programs that do really well, you find that there's collaboration more at the executive level to say, hey, what are you guys doing? How is it working? Uh, some of our quality officers will talk with other facilities that do things well um, that might match what our, what our population could use. And so it really creates that sort of collaborative environment for um, sort of the hospitals that are in similar size groupings um, and with the similar resources that we have. Uh, good morning, Dr. Ed and Teresa. My background, just so you know, I, I spent 35 years as a safety environmental engineer, and, and I was also a firefighter and EMT for a lot of years. Um, so a lot of this falls into my wheelhouse, and I, I find it very interesting. On the, on the clot-busting drugs for the stroke, is that now a paramedic skill? Can that be delivered in the field? So first and foremost, thank you for your service. Thank you. Um, Second, I will say I am proud to uh, report that I am the medical director for our, right. our pre-hospital system, so I'm very invested in that in that forum. Um, currently, we do not deliver clot-busting drugs in the field because we need a CT first, um, but we do have um, an active integrative program now where they are uh, notifying from the field with a stroke score or a heart attack score, and we're activating those teams from the field so that when they arrive, we have that drug at the bedside. And so it is more of a collaborative, but it would be a little unsafe to give that agent to someone who might be bleeding, for example, mm -hmm. as opposed to having an occlusive stroke. And so although some countries are doing sort of uh, intra-ambulance therapy, uh, the United States has not adopted that yet. Is it a different drug for a heart attack than it would be for a stroke? Slightly different dose, but the same drug. Okay. And as, as far as the um, on the COPD side of things for as a young safety engineer, West Virginia and a couple other states were sort of the poster children for COPD, black lung and that sort of thing. Have, have we gotten that under control over the years? So unfortunately, we, have, we, we still rank in the bottom, but we are making ground quickly. And I think a lot of that revolves around uh, some of our smoking cessation programs for youth and a little bit more of our. Um, sort of workplace environment protections. Um, we also have a pretty good cadre of pulmonologists now that are, um, you know, sort of been working in this environment for a while that have been doing a pretty good job in this space. Um, and so it's really helped to, to sort of prevent new onboarding of folks with those diseases and then sort of stabilization of those older folks that currently have it. So I think we're, we're really making our best strides in prevention of newer folks developing those diseases a little bit more so than, uh, you know, than kind of the people who currently have it just trying to stabilize their disease and prevent progression. The other thing that's really interesting for, for our state is we have developed um, these um, kind of the continuum of care from pre-hospital to hospital to post-hospital care and using some of our paramedicine uh, programs to develop in-home visits after someone's discharged so that we can make sure that they're getting access to the medications we provided, that their oxygen saturations are staying okay, and that they don't need to come back to the hospital. Um, and that program um, is starting to mature. It'll probably be in the next year 100% uh, penetration to anybody who leaves the hospital with a diagnosis of COPD. Right now we're sort of targeting higher risk patients, those that are already on oxygen or who may have been ventilated in the hospital. But ultimately we'd really like to have those follow-up appointments. They're, they're just really random visits from our EMS um, fellows 
um, to, to make sure that they're doing well, that they got what they needed at home, that they have follow-up appointments scheduled. And as you can imagine, those are the big three to prevent people from having to come back. And so it's that collaboration again. I think that's the way we're going to win with some of these chronic diseases is really having that collaboration across the spectrum. What is the medical difference between heart attack and heart failure? Ah, oh, good, great question. So heart attack is sort of the active thing. So if you are, so people who have heart failure often will have a pump that just doesn't function very well, but it's still functioning. And so if you think of, you know, an engine that's sort of dying, um, it can still get around the track, but it maybe can't perform at its best. Whereas the heart attack is when the engine itself is really now just in, in shock, is, is now having a, an acute event. Um, and so we, we treat those acute events, again, with either those clot busting drugs or by going to the catheterization lab and trying to remove the obstruction. Whereas heart failure in general is more of a chronic condition, usually the result of either prolonged high blood pressure or previous heart attacks. And we, we work to maximize the effectiveness of that muscle and reduce the work that it has to do. So one is really an acute event um, where time and energy is, is literally the muscle activity of the heart. And the other is a chronic lifestyle changes and sort of uh, change in the way that people are medicated to optimize what remains as the function of that muscle. And if we do that well, we actually can improve that function over time so we can gain back some function after an event has occurred. You're just tuning in. We're talking with Dr. Mike Molodner from WVU Medicine. And recently, WVU Medicine Berkeley Medical Center has been named by U.S. News & World Report to its 2024-25 best hospitals as a high-performing hospital in three specialties, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, or COPD, heart attack, and heart failure. This is the highest distinction a hospital can earn for U.S. News Best Hospitals Procedures and Conditions Ratings, and they have evaluated nearly 5,000 hospitals to come up with this list. Any idea how many hospitals get this distinction across the country, Teresa or Dr. Laudner? I, I, don't, I don't know if you have those numbers, Teresa. I don't have those. I yeah, do not. That's okay. Yeah, so in general, the rankings usually, will, you'll see U.S. World Report does a few things. They have specific rankings from one to 100 top hospitals, mm -hmm. but then they also take their top tiers. And so these are top 10 or 15% providers. So all the folks that receive this distinction are the top 15% of performers. Um, and so... Theoretically, um, those benchmarks could be achieved by every hospital if everybody could do that. So you're not competing against each other. You're competing against metrics for outcomes, if that makes sense. It does. Also, WVU Medicine Berkeley Medical Center has also received from the American Heart Association their Get With the Guideline Stroke Gold Plus Quality Achievement Award for its commitment to ensuring stroke patients receive the most appropriate treatment according to nationally recognized research-based guidelines. But my question to both of you would be, in regards to... Uh, these two awards, they, they both center around stroke and uh, heart uh, health, uh, COPD. Uh, we're all talking about pretty much the same area of the body here. So how is it that, the, that you have such high achievement in this specific area? And I know you mentioned earlier that there was an effort made to concentrate on, 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 on improving and, and getting as, as good as you can be quality-wise with these. But was it anything else that went into this or a reason for the focus? Well, I would say that every um, every three years, I'm going to talk a, a bit about our yeah. community health needs assessment that we do, Dr. Lawner, and you know, yes, so we survey the community, so we get an idea of issues that and 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 conditions that we need to focus on. And chronic disease is always in the top three, mm -hmm. along with mental uh, health types of issues. Um, so the heart, the stroke. Um, the diabetes, you know, all of those um, fall into the COPD, fall into that chronic disease. So, uh, you know, we develop plans to try to improve um, these statistics um, and work on establishing programs. And uh, and as Dr. Lawner said, uh, you know, the improvement that we've seen over the past several years since COVID um, certainly uh, is 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 a focus of ours again. Uh, we've done three community health needs assessments so far, and every one, the chronic diseases is, a, as I said, in the top three. Dr. Laudner, anything to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say one of the things that has also allowed us to excel is our alignment with WVU. Um, you know, we have garnered in the last few years a much stronger relationship, um, both in recruiting individuals. 
um, and, uh, and also trying to become a little bit more consistent providers at a tertiary level as opposed to sort of as a primary level. And so becoming a sort of bigger hospital with a few academicians here allows us to bring a different quality of provider to the community that looks at not only how we're treating patients, but also um, involving improving the things that we're doing that we didn't necessarily have access to before. So to Teresa's point, we use those assessments to develop strategic plans each year and over three years and over five years. And these are the results of people deliberately saying, hey, this is a very at-risk population. What can we do to grow that? What can we do locally as a grassroots program? And what do we have in the system that we can sort of um, mirror or develop um, and get some support from so that we can bring that here? And those two things together have been very powerful tools. How are, excuse me. How are we advancing in West Virginia? Well, Eastern Panhandle, anyway. That's where we are in terms of uh, shock trauma centers, development of, of treatment of shock trauma. Is it, so, in general, we have um, sort of changed gears. We still live right along 81. So, even though we've always been sort of a, a smaller ish hospital, we've always had a high level of trauma, both at Berkeley Medical Center and at the Jefferson Medical Center. And so, um, we have started the alignment with the uh, with uh, American College of Surgeons to be a level three trauma center here. Um, ultimately, within the next probably 24 months, looking to become a level two trauma center by bringing in 24-hour-a-day surgeons that are available on call and in subspecialties, both neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, um, so that we can treat these folks. We've also increased the standards of our ICUs to have 24-hour-a-day intensivists available so that we can be keeping those folks here locally instead of trying to ship them out for care. And it is becoming, as you're well aware because you're asking the question, it's becoming a real issue, uh, you know, sort of across the state because, uh, you know, it affects obviously all age groups. But now that we have more people who are on blood thinners, um, you know, we have uh, folks with motor vehicle crashes on the highway, sports injuries that all lead to multi-system trauma. And it is one of the largest costs. And so the idea of not having to fly people around the state but be able to take care of them locally, not only is better for their patient care, but it's also better for their family care. Their families can be closer. Their rehab can be closer to home. Um, we can invest a little bit more from the families uh, to, to be able to help out with those processes. And it just makes it easier on everybody long term. And the results are just uh, just head and shoulders above what they've been in the past. And it all comes down to that magic hour, the same magic hour for the stroke and everything else. Absolutely. Getting people in, getting them quickly evaluated, and having the resources here to start acting immediately. The shorter time frame that the, the body continues to downward spiral, the less damage that's done, the better the recovery will be. So I saw there was a traffic accident back road, Beddington Road around here, and there was a, a chopper took somebody off. Where is he likely going? Uh, most likely to our helipad, depending on what the injury is. Um, there are some times where they will go directly to somewhere else, uh, whether it be uh, Ruby or Inova or Win Winchester. Uh, all, we're the four, uh, including us, that would be the receiving sites for any of those uh, on-site um, airlifts. Got about five minutes remaining. What's the status of the ORs right now at the hospital? We are open. We reopened our ORs. What what date was that, Dr. Laudner? Do you remember the actual uh, date? The initial opening was on the 5th and then the last of the rooms on the 11th and 13th. So we are fully functional um, and actually a bit upgraded as a result of that. So very good news. And thank you, everybody, for your patience while we went through that. There was a lot of community support for what went on. Um, people were super understanding, and we were able to move them to different places on our campus to get those procedures done. And now we are back up and running fully. In six and a half weeks, I might add. Six and a half six weeks. Six and a half weeks. And when we had that flood <laughs> on Memorial Day, we thought we, our O's would probably be down until September. So again, as Dr. Laudner said, just lots of support from our system, mm -hmm. from the other hospitals in the system, from individuals um, coming down to assist. So that, that was that was a miracle, <laughs> in my opinion, um, to, to get those ORs rebuilt, basically, yeah. and reopened. So. Well, Dr. Laudner, did you play in the golf tournament? Oh, I had to stay at home and work at the hospital. I don't get to go play, but I will tell you, I did oh. sponsor a team, um, and they came in fourth, which is amazing because nice. one of them is my son. <laughs> um, who's not a very good golfer, so he must have been paired with someone who was very good. And that's we all harsh. Did sponsor a team at, what's that? I said, that's harsh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he would, he would, he's a great driver, 
But, you know, the young kids don't have the patience for the short game yet, True. so he's learning. Yeah. Um, but Don't we do touch. have also a sponsor to pickleball team. Yes, so they do. Uh-huh. You guys, we had the greatest time last year. Well, Anybody it was who fun. has any interest at all in playing, please get out there. It was super fun. Dr. Laudner was there the entire time. Again, he had uh, a team, so... Mm-hmm. Um, so, what, yeah. what, what is the uh, the labor pool like at the hospital right now in regards to nurses and doctors and recruitment? Uh, how are you? What's your status? Um, yeah, so great great news for us. We just recruited sixty new graduate nurses into our intern and externship programs. That's the largest recruitment class we've had in a long time, um, and so really getting away a lot from uh, you know that very publicized um, you know sort of travelers model. We're we're really back to almost fully staffed with uh, our, our own folks. Um, and that's really great because they have a better investment in what's going on in the growth of the hospital. From the physician side, we've almost doubled our volume of physicians in the last 36 months. And we'll look to do that again over the next 36 months, filling in some of these new subspecialties, but also very needed primary care roles uh, in the community and, and sort of some of the growth in some of the existing programs, uh, bringing on a few new surgeons, introducing a bariatric program here, We've recently introduced vascular and uh, thoracic surgery here, things that we have not had before. So these are things that are really great for our local community. And then, of course, the primary care, you know, developing more primary care sites so that there's uh, quicker access and more availability. And construction and expansion and additional locations coming up. Yes. In fact, uh, just got word yesterday we will be reopening our same-day surgery entrance, a new entrance, and a brand-new waiting room the middle of August. So we're looking forward to that and then uh, the additional work on the perioperative side of our OR expansion at Berkeley Medical Center. All right. Very good. Any other locations around the eastern panhandle springing up in the future? Uh, Not that we can talk about right now. But, so, but there are plans. plans. There, there are, are plans. plans. Yes. All right, very good. Dr. Yes. Laudner, thank you so much for your time this morning. We greatly appreciate it. Any final thoughts from you, sir? I just really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you. And if you ever have any questions or comments or things that, that you think would be valuable, please let Teresa know, and I will be happy to get on the phone. Great to hear that, sir. Thank you kindly. Great talking to you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And uh, Teresa, a chance to revisit the pickleball registration and such. Uh, pickleball, that's not too we far have away. sponsorships available. We have individual player um, opportunities. So I would say anyone that has any questions or would like to sign up should contact Deborah Kreitz, our Director of Development, at 304-596-2147 or visit the WVU Hospitals Foundation website. Have you uh, played pickleball? I have not. Are you ready to try? I want to, Yes. Yes. To me, it just looks like a big ping pong table, yet it's if, if a The ladies of my neighborhood, part. it's, yeah. it's, it's, oh, it's taking it, it by it storm. Is, yeah. it, uh, yes. In fact, in my development, Martinsburg Station, they're talking about turning one of the tennis courts into a pickleball. Which has uh-huh. happened often. It has. And if you think about the game itself, it's the kind of game that you made up as a kid where you grabbed a few ping pong rackets and a wiffle ball, mm-hmm. and you just kind of started mm-hmm. batting I'm it back I'm definitely going to take it up. Right. When I get time. I just when don't have much time. time right now. It's always it's about the work. time. Work. I mean, you know, just work just takes up all my time. That's the thing about a hospital. It's always busy. Yes, it is. Right? 24-7. You, you better so, believe it. Thank yes. you so much for coming in. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Theresa McCabe, Dr. Michael Laudner, uh, Jerry Garcia, born this date, 1942, from the uh, Grateful Dead, uh, by the way, as the touch of gray takes us into the break.